Hi, uh, welcome to Computer Science Theory. I'm Tim Randolph, and if you're watching this, you're probably watching the asynchronous version of these lectures on YouTube. So welcome to the course. This is lecture one. We're going to spend some time talking about just nuts and bolts, basics, what the course is about, what we're going to be doing over the course of the lectures, syllabus, things like that. And then at the end of this, possibly in a subsequent video, depending on how this is divided, we'll get into actual course content. So let's get started. All right. So this is comms W3261 at Columbia, summer B 2021. And it is theory of computation. I, the person speaking, am Tim Randolph. If you're referring to me in the chat or in class or in someplace else, you can just call me Tim. If you write me an email, you can just say, hi, Tim. Um, and the first thing I want to do before this even starts off is make sure everyone has a link to the course website, because that is going to be the backbone of the course where all the information is located. So if something I say is unclear, it's probably written up on the website. If I mention a resource or I mention a link, I'll put it up on that website. So that is um, twrand.github dot io slash three two six one dot html so there will also be links to the coursework to the grade scope to all of the other learning platforms that we're using on there as well um, today we're going to do the following so first we're going to go over what is this course about Uh, second, we're going to talk a little bit about the structure of the course. Third, we're going to go over the syllabus, all the little nuts and bolts things. Then we're going to finally dive in and talk about strings, languages, maybe not the type you're familiar with, and concept recognition. That'll be the first part, probably this video on YouTube. And then later on in the lecture, we'll hopefully talk about uh, things called DFAs, which stands for deterministic finite automata. and also regular languages. So these are gonna be our first building block concepts. So first item, if you're here, hopefully you don't know quite what this course is about, but you wanna get some idea. You wanna decide whether or not to drop before the first week is over, or you're just excited to figure out, okay, how do we get into this interesting subject that you know a little bit about? So what is this course about? Um, well, roughly speaking, it's this. I'm gonna call it using math to answer fundamental questions about computation. So here I've given you an answer to your question and it's probably raised more questions. So now we've ended up in a spot where I have to explain more. For instance, using math, okay, you might ask why math? Why not use some other explanatory paradigm to talk about computers? That's a reasonable question. You might also ask, what math? So if you're familiar with math, um, 
maybe in your discrete math class, but likely in other classes, you haven't talked about computation. You haven't used concepts that have directly ref referenced computing things, hardness, complexity, things that you're familiar with from programming. Um, I wrote fundamental questions. So it's reasonable to ask, okay, what questions are those? And of course I wrote computation, which is what the course is about, but I haven't defined it yet. So you could reasonably ask, you know, what is computation? And if you're like me, before you take this course, your working answer to this question is like, well, computation is what the metal boxes do. It's what happens when I plug my program in and hit the go button. Um, and that's a good functional answer and it'll suit you all for software engineering, but it's hard to think more deeply about what is really going on here. What do computers do that makes them different from other sorts of objects in the world? What makes a computer unique among machines or unique among things that humans interact with? So hopefully the mathematical definitions we're gonna use will shed some light on this third question. And to try to answer these things, I'm gonna take a step back because I can't resist doing so. My training is in philosophy, but we'll get back to nuts and bolts really quick. We'll talk really briefly about empirical science first. It's sort of a contrast. So I'm a theorist. I don't know exactly what empirical scientists do, but they tell me it's something like this, or this is sort of the idea I have. First, you start with the question, what's going on? And to answer this question, you do a very natural thing. You go look at stuff. And sometimes we call this, you know, doing experiments or making observations. So you've asked what's going on. You've gone outside, you've looked at stuff, and then ideally you take all that data back into the laboratory and you organize your observations into explanations. And then I guess the last step is you hope your observations are helpful or predictive. Ideally, you have theories that are simple and they tell you what's gonna happen next. And then when you go out and look at more stuff, it matches up with the predictions that your theories come up with. And this is a really useful way to try to understand the world, but it's not immediately helpful for computation if we're not used to seeing computation in the world. And in particular, in contrast to empirical science, we're gonna do something in this course, which is more like what you've seen maybe in a math class or a philosophy class. We're gonna look at a slightly different paradigm called formal science. And formal scientists are gonna start with the same question. What's going on? But they're gonna tackle it in a slightly different way. In particular, what they're gonna do is invent concepts and symbols. So these could be things like numbers or triangles or you know, the abstract notion of the good. These are things you've never seen in the real world. I've never seen a triangle and yet I use triangles all the time. I mean, ideally I have some idea that they correspond to things in the real world, but that's not strictly necessary for me to invent these concepts and symbols. Then the next thing I'm gonna do is use these concepts and symbols that I've invented to prove new conclusions inside my formal system. And the last step as always is hoping, hope my conclusions help us in the real world. So both types of science are kind of predicated on hope, but at the same time, they've been remarkably successful. Empirical science combined with formal science 
has let us do things like send rockets to the moon, supposedly. So, you know, maybe triangles are not such a bad idea after all. And we're going to use the formal science model to think about computation. That is, we're going to invent concepts and symbols in this course that help us think about and talk about um, the sorts of things that computers do in a very abstract way. Then we're going to reason with those concepts and symbols to get to new conclusions, which hopefully are very deep statements about computation itself. That'll depend a little bit on how we do our initial definitions, and it'll require a little bit of faith in hoping that the metal boxes we have in the real world are like the ones we write down on paper. But I hope you're going to find it's really illuminating and interesting. Certainly what I think, but I'm very biased. So TCS, formal science for computers. That's one way of cashing out this particular first statement that I've written down, using math to answer fundamental questions about computation. So all right, at this point, we're probably ready for an example to answer this question. OK, how can math teach us about computers? And I'm actually going to start with a theorem that you may have seen before in a discrete math class, and you may not have associated with computation. Um, and this could be because it's a theorem that touches all different kinds of areas of math. It's very deep. Um, but I'm going to walk through it again and then talk about what it means and the sorts of concepts it deals with. Because I think it's relevant to the way we want to think about computation. So this theorem. Oh, and by the way, this is probably not this proof is not strictly required for the course. So if you want, you can just sit back, stop taking notes and enjoy this bit. We'll have a little philosophizing time. So this is a theorem proved by Cantor, Georg Cantor, German mathematician in 1891. And he proved you can't enumerate the real numbers. Usually we write the real numbers with this blackboard face R. The real numbers refer to any number that you could put down on a number line, um, can be represented by a usually infinite decimal. And what I mean by enumerate is roughly describe a finite rule or program if you want for writing them all out in order. And we'll come back to enumeration and talk about it more later in the course. For now, this is about as precise as we need to be. So this statement that you can't enumerate things, um, well, it's not true for some other sets of numbers, even infinite sets. Like, you know, for the natural numbers, which if you remember, usually you start with one and then you count up as far as you want one, two, three, et cetera, you can totally enumerate the natural numbers. And one proof of this fact would just be to write a program to do it. So if I wanted to write a program to enumerate the natural numbers, I would say, okay, something like set a variable i equals one, while true print i and add one to i. And if I've written this program correctly, um, you guys may be better software engineers than me, but hopefully I can get something this short, right? This will start by initializing the variable i to one, and then over and over, it'll print the thing, add one to it. In a sense, this is a finite rule. It's a finite procedure that'll write down all the natural numbers. And I can also do this for, you know, other infinite sets like the integers, which is the set
of all whole numbers, including the negatives and zero. So for this one, I would say, okay, something like print zero while true. Um, probably should also set i equals one. Print i, also print negative i, and then increment i. So again, this program is really similar. I've added an extra step, and in a sense, we're looking at the set that I've written out with the dots. We're starting at zero, and we've written a program to write them all out. It'll go zero, one, negative one, two, negative two, three, negative three. And if I wanted, I could write a, out a complete proof, which would demonstrate for any integer that you want to pick. Eventually, my program will write it down. So natural numbers, enumerable. Um, integers, enumerable. Real numbers, according to this theorem by Cantor, not enumerable. And let's see why, just because it's a fun proof. So let's suppose for contradiction. So again, this is proof by contradiction is an assumed uh, concept for this course, uh, but it's relatively simple. We want to prove a thing is true, so we assume it's not true and then reason our way to a logical impossibility. Therefore, our initial assumption that it wasn't true must be false. The thing has to be true. So we'll suppose for contradiction that there does exist a procedure for enumerating the real numbers are. And we'll consider the output of this procedure. So for example, we'll say the first number my procedure outputs is like 0 0.0002, maybe some more digits, 1.0000, some more digits, 0 0.0921, 0 0.3213. And we'll assume that this keeps going forever. And by our assumption, there exists some procedure, or this is a procedure that enumerates all of the reals eventually. And now we'll just create a new real. By incrementing the nth digit of the nth number for all n. And what I mean by this sentence is I'm going to define my real, my new real, digit by digit as follows. So I wonder if I can, ooh, I can change the color. The first digit, I'll take my zero, I'll increment it, turn it into a one. Second digit, I'll take the second digit of my second number, my zero, turn it into a one. Third digit, I'll take the third digit of my third number, increment nine, we roll over, get a zero. Do the same thing all the way down the line. So I've now created this real number. And now I claim our new real is nowhere in the original list. And to see this, we can just look at our list and say, well, suppose that our new real number is at position 1 million and three. Well, I can disprove that. I can look at position 1 million and three and say, no, look, it incremented that number at that position. Our new real is different from the number in position 1 million and three. And no matter what, by definition, this sequence, this new real number is not in my enumeration. So this contradicts our initial assumption. And therefore we have that the real numbers 
cannot be enumerated. So why is this statement cool and why is it related to computation? Well, if you think about what we're saying, it might be a sort of mathematical fact that you haven't proved much before. Like when you do math proofs, often it's something like, well, okay, prove 100 plus 3 is 103. It's pretty simple, assuming you have some rules for addition, or prove that there exists a thing that does this, or that this statement is false. Um, well, I guess that's a separate category. But often it's proving simple statements about what exists um, and finding individual things. But this is a statement that's a little different because this theorem is a theorem about something you can do, right? Cantor's proved something about what anyone, any computer, any person for all time can actually physically accomplish, right? What you can and can't enumerate. Cantor's proof places a limit on a program you can write in Java because he's essentially proved you can't write a program that writes out all the reals. You just can't do it by this argument. So in this way, this is a new and unusual type of statement. And in fact, proving this statement kicked off proofs of a bunch of other related statements about things you can say and things that you can't say, things that can be proved and things that can't be proved within mathematics. And this proof, and later on down the line, proofs by people like Gödel and others, made mathematicians excited, made them angry, made them scared, and generally opened up a whole new field of inquiry um, that led ultimately to computation. So that's why this sort of statement and this sort of proof, I think, is so cool. It's also, in mathematical terms or in historical terms, startlingly recent. You've only had, I mean, I suppose I don't want to pick 1891 as the date of the birth of computation because this is really a fairly unrelated result. But you've only had people asking these sorts of questions in these sorts of ways for a very brief period of time. This is a science that is still developing and still developing rapidly. So, you know, there's no theory of computation textbook from before, call it 1980. Some people in the department might correct me on that. But at any rate, it's not that old. So we're doing new stuff. We're doing stuff that excites and scares mathematicians. That enough should be a reason for us to think it's fun and to get into doing it. So maybe that example will help you think a little bit more about how math can teach us about computers. Course structure. So I'd like to give you a high level of what we're going to do. I've been trying to do that already. Uh, some of these terms will necessarily be nebulous, but we'll come back. Um, to recap, basically what we've said, what we'll do, we'll build math tools and objects related in some way to computing. And then we will then use those tools to learn and prove things about computing. And then the things that we learn and prove will take us back to where we started. We'll want to define more powerful or more interesting mathematical tools. And this is basically theoretical computer science in a nutshell. Hopefully I've given you an idea now of what we're doing in this course and how it's probably different from most of the computer science that you're familiar with. Uh, some specific tools we'll use include automata, which is a fancy Greek word for maybe little computers, little memories, little beings, um, I like to think of them as concept recognizers. They're little math machines. And in particular, we'll talk about um, deterministic, finite automata, or DFAs. 
um, non-deterministic finite automata, um, push down automata, oops, I'm on top of my arrow. There we go. And Turing machines. If you recognize none of the other words on this list, Turing machines might ring a bell as a fun thought experiment you've heard about before or seen in some other class. And we'll also talk about grammars. Not the linguistic kind. These are more like concept definers. Rules for creating well-defined concepts, which I suppose is what grammar is in linguistics too, including things like regular expressions, uh, context-free grammars, and a few other things. We'll also talk about a couple of other ideas. So concepts like decidability, And that's related to the question, um, can a computer answer this yes, no question? And usually it's not a specific yes, no question, but it's a sort of yes, no question. So it'll be something like, here's a whole class of problems, like, you know, all of the addition problems. Well, that's not a good, that's not a yes, no question, is it? All of the recognizing prime problems. Can a computer do this sort of question? Recognize this prime? Is this number prime? Well, yes, usually that question is decidable, but there are some questions which turn out to be really hard, even impossible for computers. We'll also think about the question of reducibility. So this is something like, suppose we have two tasks. Task A and task B. Uh, a reduction is just proving the statement, uh, if you can do A, you can do B. In a sense, reducing uh, B to A, right? Because now instead of doing B, I can just do A instead or do whatever procedure I've proved allows me to do B if I can do A. And this lets us prove things like, okay, well, if B is doable, sorry, if A is doable, then clearly B is doable, right? That's what our if then statement implies. And you can also prove the uh, contrapositive, which is something like if B is not doable, right? If this part's false, then clearly A can't be doable because otherwise if A was doable, it would um, disprove my initial assertion. So we'll come back to reducibility. It's okay if that makes your head spin a little bit at the moment. And finally, we'll talk about complexity which is if a task A is doable, how hard is A? And hardness will turn out to be definable in a lot of different ways. So if I ask how hard is A, often it turns out, at least in computer science, I'm asking how many resources does it take? How much time does it take me to do? Uh, how complex is the um, program that's going to solve this problem in terms of memory? How much randomness does it use? How much quantumness does it use? How much magic does it use? We're allowed to use magic of some sort as long as we um, remember that we're living in the mathematical world. So that's more or less what we'll do in this course. Build math tools and objects related to computing and then use them to learn and prove things about computing. We've got all of these concepts, which you're welcome to jot down. 
Um, I don't expect most of this stuff to make sense to you right now, but in case you've heard these terms before, you'll have some idea what's coming up. And I suppose at this point, it's my job to give you nuts and bolts. So syllabus information, practical things that have to do with you succeeding in this course that you'll need to know. So three syllabus. And first, I want to emphasize um, again, read the course website. I'm going to go relatively briefly through this stuff because you can find the details on the website. And to be honest, it's not probably worth your time to copy it all down when you can go look it up at any point. So I'll say all the things here. I won't necessarily write them all. And I'll trust you to either, you know, seek to this point in the video if that's your preference, or just go look it up whenever you need the specifics of this information. So what does the website have on it? It has people. So me, that's Tim, your wonderful TAs. So human, Annie, Quintus. Elena and Brian. It also has the dates and times of class, all of our office hours. Uh, it'll tell you to go to the courseworks and find the Zoom links for all the office hours that are virtual, which I think most of them are, although I will have some in-person office hours. I'm going to try to be around for this course as much as possible. In particular, we're moving fast and this material is cumulative, so I want people to I would really appreciate it if you would jump on problems before they get out of hand. If you have a really hard time with the lecture, if you think I did a terrible job teaching it, if you just want to come and chat, please come to my office hours. I'll have, I think, six office hours a week. Some of them will be in person in my office. Most of them will be virtual. So hopefully that there are times during that window that'll work for everybody. And if people come, especially if you show up early and ask your questions, um, it's just, it's a much easier way to do a highly cumulative course rather than running behind, jumping ahead will save you a ton of work. So yeah, all of that stuff is on the website. So let's see, that was office hours is on there. Dates, times, um, links to our various platforms. So courseworks, um, we're using a platform called Ed or EdSTEM for course discussion. This is the new Piazza. I think most courses have already switched. So we'll be monitoring questions on there. Uh, Gradescope, which if you've never used before as a website for turning in your homework online, that makes it easy for us to grade you and also lets us do it anonymously and grade all the problems in a block, one problem per TA, which hopefully makes things much fairer and prevents any bias from creeping into our grading. So. Problem sets are going to be available and submitted on Gradescope. And then finally, the YouTube channel for the course, where you're probably watching this video right now. It's possible that later in the course, we'll transition from YouTube to just using course recordings on Zoom that show up on CourseWorks. If so, I'll try to put these videos um, online so they're available after the course ends off of CourseWorks. What else? Uh, oh, yeah, course modality. So we've got in-person, we have um, live stream. So while the class is going on, you can watch it on Zoom and have a moder moderated chat or asynchronous. If you're watching this, you're watching asynchronous. So not much more to talk about there. Homework. We'll have six problem sets. They're supposed to take, you know, maybe four or five hours of your time. This is only a six week class. It's highly compressed. We have two, three hour lectures every week, which means homework is going to come fast and thick. It is uh, a cumulative course. So what I've chosen to do is make the homeworks assigned on Monday. And do Monday at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time, 
which means effectively you have one week for homework. And the reason is we'll do material on Monday and Wednesday, and I think it's really important that you carefully think about it by next Monday. Because next Monday, we're going to be jumping onto new stuff that'll depend on stuff from the previous week. So again, it should just be an expectation of we do the work on Monday and Wednesday. You jump on the homework starting Tuesday. Maybe you have it done on Thursday. Submit it to Gradescope um, by the end of the day, the following Monday, where we're starting the next tiny subunit. I do have a late policy. So you can read the details of the late policy on the website. It boils down to three late days, which you can take at any time. Beyond that, once all your late days are used up, there's a 20% penalty for assignments turned in every day afterward. And then the absolute latest day, any problem set can be turned in is the Friday of the week that it's due. So that's four days later, four days after Monday at 11.59. Um, yeah, so that's the homework and that's the rationale behind the homework. Uh, when you turn in your homework, you can do can turn in anything complete, neat, and readable, which means I will technically accept handwritten work. You can write your homework on paper and scan it and turn it into grade scope. However, I'm going to give the TAs permission to dock people for things that are incomprehensible. So, you know, if you write chicken scratch, that's fine. Just type it up. Uh, if you do want to type it up, I highly encourage LaTeX, which if you haven't used this before, it's a markup language that you'll use a lot in layer math and computer science classes. Basically, a markup language is like HTML. You write some code that looks vaguely like what you want to show up on one pane. You hit the compile button, and it compiles it into nicely formatted math. So if you're sick of using Microsoft Word Mathematics or whatever, definitely highly recommend you try out LaTeX. It's a great skill for later career. And in particular, um, I recommend the website Overleaf to get started. So this is like Google Docs for LaTeX. You log in, you create a document, you have the pane that you're writing in and the pane that you compile on. You don't have to deal with downloading various packages because they're all built into the network and you can keep all of your homework online in one folder. So that's homework. The exam, we'll have one exam at the end of this course. It'll be cumulative, covering all material. Obviously, not a very long course, and it will be virtual. There won't be virtual proctoring or anything like that. Instead, it'll be, you can take it during any consecutive 12 hours within a certain 48 hour period. Uh, what I mean by that, this will likely be August 10th to 11th during finals week. I'll say, here's the 48 hour window. I'll release the exam. Um, you will be on the honor code to open it up, only work on it during a consecutive 12 hours. You shouldn't need to spend 12 hours on the exam. 12 hours is designed for you to, I don't know, for instance, wake up, eat a nice breakfast, read over the problems, let them sit for a while, do some scratch work, take a nap, come back, write them up, turn the exam in. Uh, it will be open book and open notes. So it's designed to kind of defray some of the incentives to cheat that are present in any virtual system. Um, the grading breakdown. So this will be, we've got our six problem sets. times 12% of the grade plus one exam. If I've done the math right, it's 28% of the grade equals 100%. So the exam will be about, um, this is 28. it'll be about third of the course grade. Problem sets will be important. I'm not gonna drop the lowest problem set. Uh, again, I really do think it's important that you think clearly and deeply about these problems. Uh, and we'll have a problem set. First one will be available after today's lecture if you're really excited to get going.
Oh, and finally, I want to say a word about collaboration. So in particular for problem sets, they are open textbook, open notes, and open to reference websites. So again, I'm giving you some latitude and some trust with what parts of the internet you're allowed to use for homework. In particular, Wikipedia is a reference website. So if you want to go on Wikipedia and read their definition of a deterministic finite automata, feel free to go do that. Same thing for theorems and stuff like that. Um, on the off chance that I assign a problem that exists on a reference website like ProofWiki, uh, in that case, the proof is off limits. Obviously, don't go read the substance of the answer. Um, similarly, no Q&A websites. So, absolutely categorically no taking the homework problem and posting it on Stack Overflow or Kaggle or something else that will, where somebody else will come give you an answer. I will be checking those sites if I find it. Um, well, there'll be a, a cheating policy that's on the website, but I'm not going to go into it now. Um, but that said, there's a lot of freedom here. Open textbook, open notes, open, ref open reference websites. Uh, collaboration is fine. Uh, especially in office hours. So I'd encourage you if you want people to work with, come to office hours. We can stick you in breakout rooms and hang out and work on the problems together. But in particular, a couple of things that are not okay. Uh, let's see, write up your own work. So, you know, you can have a rich shared whiteboard discussion with a friend, but after that point, you should go home and write it up by yourself without the help of that friend. And then no sharing um, written solutions or notes. So this applies to things like, um, like if I'm working with a friend, can we both be doodling on the same whiteboard? Absolutely. Um, but I can't write up a solution or write up notes for solving something and then hand it to my friend so he could take it over, take it home and read through my notes um, and effectively copy my solution. So hopefully that sort of thing is clear. Um, you know, I trust you guys to be honorable and straightforward about this stuff, um, but I'm gonna be relatively severe if I catch people not following those rules. Okay, so I think with that, we've covered syllabus, we've covered the nuts and bolts. Again, if you have a question and you're watching asynchronously, you can post it in ed, you can email me, you can email one of the TAs, and also, of course, read through the whole syllabus website. Okay, now we finally get to get into some fun math. The first building blocks of our course, some of the discrete math objects that we'll use to construct other more interesting discrete math objects. So in particular, oh man, I think I have to title this section concepts, even though that's a very bold heading for a computer science course. The normal heading I think would be strings and languages. So strings and languages, or actually first what you make strings with. So I'm going to define this thing called an alphabet, which is any non-empty finite set. And what you should kind of be thinking of, the subtext, what we're going to use these things for, we're going to use them to build words called strings. So some examples. Um, this is a finite set. It contains zero and one, and we call it the binary alphabet. Here's another finite set, A, B, C, dot, 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 and yay, oh, with a line through it if you're Norwegian. 
eventually Z. Call that the Roman alphabet. Actually, maybe with these extra characters, it's not Roman. Point is letters. Um, zero, one through nine, that would be the decimal alphabet. You may not be used to thinking of decimals as alphabets, but you know they're a set of symbols that we use to make numbers out of. And of course, you're perfectly free to you know, define your own alphabet. Happy shapes. Um, things in alphabets are called symbols or characters. And now that we have alphabets, we can make strings out of them. And these are very similar to the strings you've seen when you programmed in Java or C. So a string is a finite sequence of symbols from an alphabet. And just to refresh your memory on some of this terminology, one of the assumed discrete math words, a sequence is just an ordered set. So this is just an ordered set of symbols that might have some repetitions in it. So examples of strings. In the binary alphabet, I could have the string 0, 1, 0, the string 0, the string 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, uh, I can't have an infinite string. That's part of the definition. I could also have in Roman, cat, dog, um, ZX, B, L, F, F. Those are all strings in the Roman alphabet. 101 or 199, both strings in the decimal alphabet. Um, these little ticks are not necessary. But typically, we write strings. You know, You might usually be used to writing a sequence like in parentheses with commas in between. Typically, just by convention, we'll write strings as concatenated strings of symbols, like you'd write them down if you were writing code. But they are sequences, just because every uh, symbol has a place, and every place has a symbol. There's also a special string, which is this little epsilon, and it is called the empty string. So it's a symbol that denotes the absence of any symbol. It's um, the sequence of length zero that has nothing in it. So this empty string um, is a string in the language of any alphabet. Oh, we've got some other notation for strings as well. So if I have a string W maybe actually define two strings. Given strings w and x, um, these two lines, two straight lines, like absolute value, are the length. So 0, 1, 0, length 3. Cat, length 3. Epsilon, little empty string, length 0. We also write W superscript capital R for the reverse of W. So the reverse of cat. So cat with a little R is T-A-C. The reverse of taco cat is taco cat because it's a palindrome. And finally, we can define the concatenation of two strings. And we're not even going to use the little bubble for concatenation in this class. We're just going to write the two strings next to each other to indicate that that string just, you know, runs into the next string. The concatenation of 101 and 199 is 101, 199. So you notice that even though we're using the decimal alphabet, we don't have a notion of addition yet. But we do have concatenation. We can stick strings together. Um, what else can we do with strings? Well, we can sort them. So we can put them in order. 
let's see. I'm going to define something called lexicographic order. Um, but if you want, you can call it dictionary order. Or even being a little crude, you can call it alphabetical order. So this is just order strings, short to long. Then by their leading symbols. So what I mean by this is suppose I have a set of strings like I have before. Cat, dog, AA, empty string, pizza. And if I were to order these lexicographically, I'd start with the empty string, then AA, then cat, then dog, then pizza. Uh, first ordering by um, length of string, and then by leading symbol. I'm sorry, I made a mistake here. What else can you do with strings? Well, you can sort them. You can put them in order. So I'm going to define something called lexicographic order. Which is just um, alphabetic or dictionary order. What I mean by that is essentially sort by first symbol, then next symbol, and so on, short strings first. So if I had the strings uh, cat, Dog, A, double A, A, B, empty string, um, pizza. What I'm going to do is first I'm going to sort by first letter. So that puts the empty string in the front because the empty string is the nothingness string. Then I've got all my A's. You know, the letter A comes before AA, comes before Ardvark, comes before AB, comes before cat comes before dog, comes before pizza. So as you'd sort them in a dictionary. But of course, you can also do this for binary strings. So if I had the binary strings 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, oh. That would be a sorted uh, alphabet because, as we've defined the binary alphabet, zero comes before one. So, if we wanted to sort this, well, we've already got the little zero in the right place. Uh, zero, 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 one, zero, coming after zero, zero, um, then one, zero, one, one, one. So, you can look at this and see. Okay, this is somehow related to the binary numbers they represent, but it's not a perfect mapping. So that's lexicographic order. We'll just use it, um, use it to observe that any set of strings in a language can be ordered. Most commonly, you'll just say, I've got some big set of strings. Uh, suppose it's in lexicographic order, and then I'll deal with it some way in a proof. So this is a nice concept to have in your back pocket. We'll use it later. And now 
that we've got our languages, sorry, we've got our alphabets and we've got our strings, we can make our languages. Language. So a language is any possibly infinite set of strings. So for example, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, that's a language. It's a finite set of strings on the binary alphabet. Um, this set, 0, 1, to the kth power, I should probably gloss this notation because sometimes it's used in discrete math, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's used in introductory computer science. Sometimes it's not. At any rate, what this little k means, means pick any k symbols from 0, 1. So this is any string of length k from on the alphabet 0, 1. So this is another language. I can also write languages a little more informally. So I could say, you know, the language of all strings X such that X contains at least one zero. That's a perfectly valid language. This language is infinite now because we've got all kinds of long strings that have at least one zero or even languages that seem to start to capture concepts like x such that x is the decimal representation. Always good to be clear about what alphabet you're using of a prime number. So we haven't assigned any meaning to elements in the set x. X is just a set of strings, but you could certainly look at it and say, well, this is all the decimal representations of prime numbers. Certainly writing down this set or recognizing a thing in this set has something to do with thinking about prime numbers. And in fact, that's immediately where we're going to go next. Um, I want to ponder the idea that's as follows. Languages are like concepts. You might have encountered this before, just in case you've studied some of these old formal philosophers who like to say, well, what is, what is the concept of dog? It's just a short way of referring to the set containing all the dogs. It's a very mathematical way to think about it, but it's certainly a way some people have passionately argued for in the past. Um, and it might not be the best way of talking about the concept of dog, but it seems like a pretty good way of talking about concepts like primality. Like our language above, x, where x is the decimal representation of a prime number, well, that's just all the primes written down in decimal notation. Um, and that might lead you to this idea, OK, well, idea number two. being able to tell if a string, call it W, is in a language L is like, in scare quotes, being able to recognize A concept captured by L. I'll give you another language. We'll say W, where W is a word in the English dictionary. I haven't specified what dictionary, so this language is perhaps not perfectly well defined. 
but you could certainly think of it as capturing a concept, right? The concept of English word. And you could even say someone who can tell me whether W is a word in the English language dictionary, maybe not perfectly, but maybe with some accuracy or accuracy for easy or common words, um, that person is proficient in English, or at least has memorized all the English words. Someone who can do this really well, that's one indicator that they're proficient in English. Of course, English is a lot more complicated than just a giant list of words, and primality is a lot more complicated than a giant list of primes. But we're certainly going to be thinking a lot about the concept that, I'm using the word concept too much, the idea that a language captures a concept, captures a mathematical concept, and that recognizing a language is kind of like understanding that concept, and it's even kind of like capturing the complexity of that concept in a fundamental way. Uh, another idea that you might have that I'm not going to write down, uh, being able to write down all the strings in a language, enumerate all of the natural numbers, for instance, in decimal notation, has something to do with understanding the language. So does being able to write down, like Cantor's shown us, being able to write down the natural numbers or write down the integers using a finite program does that make them different from the real numbers somehow? And how exactly? How does the difficulty of doing those things relate to what they are? Now we're getting into computational questions. And now hopefully you're starting to see why cool mathematical concepts can help us crack these nuts. So that's all for this first part of the lecture, but we will be moving on after a short break to our first language recognizing machines. So come back for that. Thanks very much for listening. Have a good one.